by plants and trees. We can make recommendations on improving soil and controlling erosion. We can provide helpful advice on attracting birds and other wildlife, how to prevent oak wilt and much more. So if you have acreage in, in Hayes County and want to visit, here's, here's the place where you can go and to request a visit. It's, it's our beautiful Hayes County uh, org website. And uh, I think um, Betsy's going to drop the link into the chat. So um, just go there and while you're there, please explore our, 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 our website because we have lots of information on it on, um, on lots of different nature subjects. Um, finally, um, let me talk to you about tonight's speaker, Ricky Lennox, who's going to talk to you about the first steps in land stewardship, which is reading your land. Ricky is a wildlife biologist who recently retired from the, the Natural Resources Cons Conservation Service, where he worked for 38.5 years. Um, for the past 18 years, Ricky served 52 counties in North Central Texas, where he assisted landowners and managers involved in, um, managers involved, which then all this involved mutual education on how to better manage rainlands for sustain, oh, sustain, oh, sustain, oh, sustainable use by livestock mm -hmm. and wildlife. Ricky is also the author of Range Plants of Northern North Central Texas, a land user's guide to their identification, value, and management. So, greetings, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, virtually give a presentation to you. Uh, it's about a topic that uh, everyone that deals with land should be well uh, versed in. Uh, and Christine asked me to kind of blend two topics together land stewardship and reading the land, and how you can use these two to help you develop a land stewardship ethic on your property. And I want to give a shout out to a good friend of mine, Steve Nelly. Hopefully you've had presentations with Steve. He shared several photos and part of his stewardship presentation with me. And that photo was taken just a little west of y'all outside of Utopia about 12 years ago. He and I were bouncing around in the bed of a small pickup driving from one creek to another on this ranch looking at riparian areas. I've known Steve over 30 years, worked with him, learned a lot from him. Hopefully you get a chance to learn from him as well. So we're going to talk about uh, some definitions, different definitions of land stewardship. And this first one is land stewardships, the conservation of your property's natural resources and features over a long period of time. Pretty basic. Managing private property to protect long-term environmental sustainability starting to stretch it out a little bit now. That's a, a good, pretty good little brief statement. The responsible use, including conservation of natural resources in a way that takes full and balanced account of the interest of society, future generations and other species, as well as private needs and accepts significant answerability to society. Now notice how this one blows it out to include society and future generations. Uh, hopefully that's your family's future generations, but we do owe a bit to society to keep this land in good shape. And hopefully you'll see that throughout this presentation. And then another one says a concept that helps define appropriate human interactions with the natural world. But the common thread or theme among most of these is a person, a person's caring for the environment not just the benefit of themselves, but for future generations. And this work is driven by voluntary personal ethics rather than legal ob ob obligations. No one forces you to take care of your land. No one forces you to overgraze your land or to overmow your land on small properties. So, you know, being a good steward, uh, and you'll see throughout this that it's, it is something that we need to think about for the future and not just for us, but for the future of society. If we think about a, a, a ranch, a large ranch, maybe next to the small acreage you own and that large ranch is overgrazing and there is an aquifer recharge zone right down from you and all of that overgrazing is leading 
a lot of sediment across your property going into that aquifer recharge. That's why we need to think about this as a benefit for society because it does affect a lot of people over time. I found this in, a, in an old book down at the bottom. There's the title, The Explorers Texas, The Lands and Waters. Now, he, Dale Winninger had two editions. The other one was The Animals They Found. But this first one on lands and water is actually very good. He did a lot of research on what early people, historical explorers, soldiers, what they wrote about this land in Texas. And he covers all the regions of Texas. And he, he showed this publication here, a sketch of the city of Austin when it was pretty small. And he, he was, he's describing in different parts of the book what prairies are, what plains are, what hills are, hilly uh, forested country is. And it's interesting that they described that area around Austin at that time as prairie. We probably wouldn't think of it as prairie now. And then he, he wrote that this unnamed editor of the Texian Advocate wrote in 1848, the hills which extend all the way from Austin to New Braunfels are covered with heavy timber. In 1848, do you still see heavy timber now on those hills? Uh, that's something to think about. But that's the kind of information that's in this book. It's a very good publication. Hopefully the library has it or we'll get a copy of it. Now I'm going to go back and reference another old book, Cattle Ranges of the Southwest by H.L. Bentley, Henry Louis Bentley. He was an agristologist in the U.S. Department of Agriculture Division of Agristology. And this was written about a little grass station that was established in Abilene, Texas, or outside of Abilene, in 1898. And I said, uh, this is his words, I'm quoting it here, a stockman who traveled from uh, San Saba, Tom Green, and Taylor counties in the summer of 1867, when there were, wasn't very many people, said that the grass everywhere was one to three feet high, sometimes as high as a cow's back, not only on the bottomlands where we see better grass today, but also in places on the drier uplands. And this quote in yellow is, hit, hit me like a sledgehammer. At that time, there is little doubt that the ranges would have supported 300 head of cattle to the square mile, 300 head of cattle to the section, 640 acres. That's very heavy stocking. That's a cow to 2.1 acres. Now, we don't know what happened back then in 1867. Maybe the buffalo had moved off. There weren't a lot of cattle in the country then around that area, except maybe some wild cattle. Uh, maybe there'd been a two or three year period of extra rainfall. Something happened to make them think that that land could support that. And it was stocked at that rate. And it probably looked like this. This is not an old photo. That's a black and, I made this into a black and white photo, but look how short the grass is everywhere. That's probably what it looked like if it was this good. And then he said, now, to, now at the end of 30 years, every condition has changed. The carrying capacity of the range has steadily decreased until it is an exceptional property that can carry one head of stock to five acres. And he says, it is claimed that that was the common average rate 10 years ago. Today, it requires at least 10 acres per head and it is often considered not the best policy to put on more than 50 cows, 50 animal units to the section of 640 acres. So look at, Texas was overgrazed before 1900. Look at this, one head per two acres in 1867. It decreased almost two and a half fold to five acres uh, 20 years later. 10 years later than that, it doubled to five to, to 10 acres. This 12.8 is when you divide 50 into 640. So, and today, depending on where you are and how much brush you might have on the property, anywhere from in the central part of the state, 15 to 50 acres for one cow today. So people are continuing to overstock their land because they don't understand how much forage it takes for one cow for one year and they overstock. So we're continually seeing um, efforts that we need to convince people that they are overstocked. But there's another old quote that a sick person, I might get it wrong here, um, a sick person must first be convinced that the medicine will in all probability 
help him in order to convince him to take it. So a lot of times people don't see the problem. What caused this overgrazing? Back in that 1867, there was so much grass, nobody bothered to learn the different grasses or which one were most readily grazed. They didn't care. There's just so much out there. Let's use it. So they had free grass. The early ranchers were the ones that really struck it rich. The only cost they had was buying a cow or rounding up a stray cow and bringing them and putting them on that land. Now, in your world there, probably the 1850s, a railroad was coming through. Out around Abilene, the railroad didn't come through till the 1882 timeframe. But when it did, it brought speculators, people that were coming out there from the east to buy land. And that created more overgrazing because these people, again, didn't know what the weather was like out there, middle of Texas, they didn't understand. And we had a loss in our habitat as a result of overgrazing. The better grasses were grazed out early. That's why we don't have Eastern Gamma grass, Indian grass, big blue stem over every acre anymore. It's been lost as a result of overgrazing. An arrival of the nester. I'm not disparaging uh, farmers, but the cropland that was put into some locations was probably not well thought out. They should have put it in areas that wasn't shallow or rocky. And that was a problem for a loss of some of our habitat. And there was an overall lack of interest in range improvement. The, the study of range management was nothing anyone even thought about at that time. No one did any drought planting. Again, they were after the grass. Let's graze it while it's here and just make the best of it. And they saw an increase in these native plants. These are all natives. Don't let anyone tell you they came in with the cattle drives from Mexico or anywhere else. These were always here, but they have certainly increased in the last 150, 200 years. Prickly pear, mesquite, ash juniper, red berry juniper, eastern red cedar, they've all increased across Texas. Now, does this uh, remind you of an event that happened in the 1930s? During World War I, there was a rush to plow up land to plant cropland to wheat. We needed it to feed the soldiers, to feed the nation, to win the war. And after World War I was over, people were still plowing up land. And then when the drought of the 1930s hit, the dust bowl. So this was the same thing happened that happened with the grazing, happened with the dust bowl and cropland. They didn't understand the land. They plowed up land that shouldn't have been plowed up. And we had a loss of stewardship in that time frame. But it, this is still happening. This is a photo uh, I took about, well, it was in 2011 during that drought year. And this is up in the rolling plains. You look at that fence, these fence line contrast photos show you a lot. Two different landowners, one on the left's got cattle, one on the right, that was actually cropland that was put into the conservation reserve program uh, probably in the uh, late 1980s or early 90s. This was a program that paid the farmers to plant it to native grasses and quit farming it, uh, marginal cropland. And so look at this wire right here. Those cows have pushed this fence all the way out to here trying to get something to eat. But can you blame them? Look at what they had to eat, yucca and mesquite. So we still see overgrazing today. It's, it's certainly not just a 19th century problem. This gentleman was the first chief of the Soil Conservation Service, which I worked for when I first started working in 1994, the name changed to Natural Resources Conservation Service to kind of acknowledge that we work with more than just the soil. But I can't see all of that because of some word, this box that's above my screen right here. Farmers and ranchers have only temporary ownership, I'm going to say, over the land. It can be theirs for a lifetime and no longer. The public's interest, however, goes on and on endlessly. If nations are to endure, land must be nurtured, not plundered and wasted. And I worked in Abilene for 14 years, and one of the ranchers that I worked with was a gentleman named Dick Atkins. He had been nominated for Conservation Rancher of the Year by the local Soil and Water Conservation District. And I was tasked to go out there and interview him and take some photos. 
And one of the quotes he gave me, and I wrote it down, and I don't have it. I've remembered it through these years. But he said, this ranch was known as the Smith Place before we bought it, and the Johnson Ranch before that. While our name is on the deed, we are just the current caretakers, and we hope to leave it to our kids in better condition than when we got it. That was the words of a true land steward, even before stewardship became a buzzword. And that's true. And that's just exactly what Hugh Hammond Bennett was saying up above there. you got to keep it and take care of it for future interest. Hopefully you've all had the opportunity to read some of Aldo Leopold's books, the Sand County Almanac, probably his most famous. And he's again realizing that ethics, uh, that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soil, water, plants, animals, and now humans and as managers, all together called the land. This is to say that once we understand that humans are not separate from, but are part of and dependent of the natural community, we'll develop an ethic to care for the community as a whole. And Aldo Leopold's time frame was in the uh, 1910s to about, he passed away, uh, had a heart attack fighting a wildfire on neighbor's lands in 1947. And the Sand County Almanac, he had been writing it and he had been turned down by numerous publishers. And one of his sons took the book in the form that he left it in 1947 and finished it. And it was released in 1948. It's never been out of print. It's that good of a book since 1948. It is inconceivable, he wrote, that a land that an ethical relation to the land can exist without love, respect, and admiration for the land, and a high regard for its value. And by value, I mean something far broader than mere, mere economic value. He realized that people needed to get paid for their product of their land, whether it's crops, grain, uh, grazing, or wildlife. And he he was a promoter of that early on. And when he talks about uh, looking at the land, what you should be doing, if you have a question about it, examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right, as well as what is economically expedient. So we're looking at a very large picture. I mean, a big picture of the land. And ethic ecologically is a limitation of freedom of action. If you've got good land ethics, you will not be someone overgrazing the land. It's a limitation on your freedoms, but it's something that's inside of you that tells you, I'm not gonna overgraze this. I'm not gonna bulldoze that brush. I know it's golden cheek warbler habitat. I'm gonna leave it. So that's, that's what he's saying here. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So we soon learn as we're growing up what's right and what's wrong and the difference. And he's saying that with land, it's the same way. You know what's right and you know what probably shouldn't be done. And we work with a land ethic, which sometimes limits the actions that we could take. Now I'm going to transition from that start of the reading of a land stewardship, and I'm going to finish with the land stewardship, but in the middle, we're going to talk about reading the land. So this is like seeing your land looking at a crystal ball. We can see the past, what happened to it by reading the land and understanding what we're seeing. We can under see the present, what's happening right now, and we can see the future. If we take good care of the land, what direction will the land go? So that's what reading the land is all about. And different people have different objectives. You might want to raise livestock and enjoy that lifestyle. That gentleman in the middle, he might just enjoy being out in wide open spaces and enjoy privacy. Gentleman on the right is hunting those birds down below. Y'all may not see many Bob Whites, but out in the Rolling Plains in West Texas, there's still Bob Whites and there's Steve Nelly, I took a picture of him enjoying fly fishing for small fish in a pond. We've got different interests, but we are all, or we can all be land stewards just the same. So we're gonna take a walk down this creek. This is Salado Creek in Bell County. I know y'all had some tremendous floods in 2015, possibly in 2016 as well. This is one of those flood events and that moves some big timber right there. 
but we're going to go down and look at some old photos. Uh, this is probably from the mid 80s. Look at this Maximilian sunflower. This was an intern that worked for the NRCS in Albany, and he's noticing that, look, the uh, Maximilian is moving away from the riparian areas and it's spreading into the uplands. That's reading the land, you're observing. Uh, I've got a stick here pointing at some plants. This is Miss Burleson on the Burleson Prairie in Bell County. Right in front of me is a six foot tall uh, compass plant. Very beautiful plant, very hard to find anymore. Almost as rare as some of these big grasses we talk about, but we're trying to learn. We're walking and talking in the pasture and trying to learn these plants. What caused this in your pasture? Well, a white-tailed buck, or it could have been another buck of another species, but normally white-tailed bucks cause these rubs. You might see the evidence. All of his antlers are shiny now. There's no uh, dried blood left on there from the softer antlers. And he'd get out at night, might see a screech owl. So it's good to visit the land in the daytime, see it at night, enjoy that land. Here we've got some conservation practices. This is brush management, controlling cedar with a bulldozer. He's got a grubber down here. He's not using the blade, but a grubber mounted below the blade. But his brush, the problem, look at the grass. Perhaps grazing management is a problem. But if you're gonna do brush, this is a good time to do it. Get it when it's small, but you need to get all of them. And then it looks like we need to put out some range seeding, range planting of native grasses and forbs to supplement the plants that are out there. Here's a rock rake, normally used to pick up rocks, but you can also pick up prickly pear, whole plants, and then take it and dump it somewhere where the plants will not touch ground again, but dump it where you can burn those eventually. Prescribed burning is a good practice. Now, it may not be used on small tracks, but it's a good practice. People often wonder about wildlife. Look in that photo. That deer is getting the heck out of Dodge. It ran across the fire guard and is leaving. It knows what's going on. They've seen fire before. And here we've got a rancher burning, uh, ranch manager carrying the drip torch, lighting a head fire, and it's racing away with the wind going across that patch. Now I wanna show you some photos that I, I've taken through the years. This was a uh, pre-burn of the uh, April 2011 wildfire season. It, it burned several million acres, about 4 million acres across Texas. Uh, this is a little county road in Palapeno County, which is two counties, uh, let's see, one county west of where I live in North Texas. And I wanna show you the part right here where I took some photos on the land, but we're looking at Google Earth. Look at the mountains over here, they're just hills. Look at all the cedar. This is a lot of ash juniper right here. This is kind of open grassland with some brush on it. Now we're gonna go from, this photo was taken 2008 before the burn. And now we're gonna see it in 2012 post burn. Look at all these hills, they're bare now because the fire raced over those hills and burned all the cedar and the other woody plants that were there. Look over here in this patch of heavy juniper. When you brown out the juniper, it dies. So all those junipers are dead. That grassland, this is an April photo. So this is probably Texas winter grass, or it could be one of the annual bromes that has come in and really greened up. It's a little too early for it to be native warm season grasses. But let's go on the ground now and look at this spot right here. There's what it looked like. Uh, you can see some, uh, this is about four months after the burn, but you can see some mesquite sprouting. Those ash junipers, once you brown out the needles, they're gonna die. And you can take a chainsaw or lopping shears and cut those ash junipers off and they'll die. Uh, but now see this uh, cedar right here? You think I can find that cedar again? five years later. Well, look at that branch right there. Here's that branch that's bent over. Here's another branch that's bent over. Let's per before we go any further, this is in August of 2011. Right here in the front is a little seedling of Western ragweed. Here's buffalo burr, buffalo burr back here, over here, and here's that mesquite. So now look at this branch that fell over. Look at this branch, and as we go forward, is that not the same tree? That's the same dead cedar. We did a little inventory of what the plants were out there, and this is what we found. 
about seven or eight grasses. The rarest of what we found was Texas cup grass. Very surprised to see it out there. Japanese brome was there. Here's meadow drop seed right here. The mesquites had grown from those little regrowth seedlings to being six to eight feet tall, multi-stem, some forbs, uh, but the land will heal after these wildfires, but it will be changed. It, the, the ash juniper will have to come back from seed if it comes back now. As thick as that grass is, it's gonna be hard for the juniper to come back. But these wildfires, they destroy the mature ash juniper and the hardwoods for a short time that the golden cheek warblers use for nesting cover. But at the same time, look at all of these oaks that were top killed and burnt down basically, but they've all root sprouted off the trunk at the base. And now we went from golden cheek warbler habitat to black cat vireo habitat. The black cat vireo needs this dense shrubby woody vegetation, a foliage apron all the way to the ground so that they can nest in. They nest at doorknob height. So if you're looking at reading the land, there was a change here. We lost golden cheek warbler habitat for probably 50 years, but we're building black cat vireo habitat. And now another photo from 2011, during the drought year, if you take care of the land, you can still have grass like this, even in a drought. And it benefits livestock, wildlife, and the most recent thing that we're managing for is pollinators. They all benefit. But if you treat the land like this, this is also 2011, a county south of where that last photo was taken. Notice this bale of hay right here. That's not good. When you're out of grass, you can't feed these cows enough to make a profit in those cows. Because when it's this short, nobody has hay and whatever hay you can find is gonna be $120 a bale. And those cows are gonna need a bale a day. So you can't, you can't save the land this way. We have to talk about the issues, get out on the ground. And that's hopefully with y'all's new helm program, this is something that can be done. Get out there and look at what's going on, read the land and see what can be seen and what directions y'all might take that land in the future. Sometimes you gotta climb the mountain, gotta get up on there and look around. Notice we've got a heavy canopy of woods here and not a lot of green vegetation on the ground. It's a heavy, dense, wooded canopy, but you find a little spot of sunlight and there, there's a little woody plant. It's not looking real healthy. You see right here, there's a, a spine that looks like a thorn, but it's actually a modified branch. This is Bumalia, but it's a warm season plant. It should, in September when this photo was taken, it should have had green leaves. So this ranch is high fenced, has no livestock, but it has deer, a white-tailed deer, axis deer, and black buck antelope. And at that time, it had too many animals. So they were impacting the uh, Bumalia. Even though it was trying to hide between this rock and some grasses, they were still finding it, giving it, giving it that browsed look. You got to take time, stop, and smell the flowers. We don't have any roses in the wild very often, but stop and smell the flowers. This is American basket flower. Deer don't eat this plant, cattle don't eat this plant. So if you're having trouble with deer, you can plant this. It's an annual. You may have to scratch the ground after the first year to get it to come back from seed. But one of the, uh, here's what it looks like when it's mature in midsummer, and you can go and harvest the seed yourself. And one of the most enjoyable things you can do is take that seed head, pull it off, put it between your index finger and your middle finger and take your thumb and just dig those seeds out. And they'll come out looking like sunflower seeds, except they're black and shiny. And you can plant those and they'll, they'll grow every year from seed. When we can get a rancher to thinking about more than just cow grass, we need something more than grass, start pointing out some plants that a rancher will realize, hey, my cows are eating that, I see that. And they eat it down. This is trailing ratney, and they need to understand that there's more than just grass out there that needs to be managed for. Get down and dig some plants up. This is a dotted gay feather on the right. It has a root that looks like an onion. It's described as a corm, C-O-R-M, but you cut it open and look at it. It's got layers like an onion. Rob, uh, this gentleman on the left is looking at some seeds of this Leavenworth Oringo. I'll show you the seeds later. 
and dig a plant up every now and then. It's amazing what some of the roots are. This is uh, bush sunflower, huge roots. That's a big storage. No doubt that that's a perennial plant from the storage that it can have right there. And Rob and I were out on his place looking uh, and we saw these, this white flower up there and couldn't figure out why is late flowering bone set growing up here on this upland prairie? And Rob said, well, I've got a water line right by there. I might have a leak. And we walk over there and sure enough, there's a leak. There were sedges growing there. It'd been leaking that long and he just never noticed it. Uh, hadn't seen the flowers till then. Get out on the land and walk the land. There's an old saying that the best fertilizer for a piece of land is the footsteps of the owner. So I encourage you, get out on the land and look at it. Now, I talk about overgrazing quite a bit. I don't disparage grazing. Uh, my degree is in range management to help landowners range and wildlife. Uh, we need cattle because we can't eat and digest the grass that's out there, but the cattle, the sheep and goats can, and we can eat the flesh of those animals. So we need good grazing. Uh, these cows were just recently turned into a new pasture and look, they're racing to get to the fresh grass. They know that they're gonna find fresh grass when they go through that gate. Now, speaking to a cattle rancher, uh, there may not be any ranchers in the crowd, but if there are, or you have relatives that are, this is something you could tell them. The importance to a cattle rancher of native grass production. Grass is the cheapest livestock feed you can raise. It's better than pouring anything out of a sack or picking up a round bale of hay. And this is not new to a rancher, but it might be new to people not familiar with the livestock industry. A rancher is in the grass raising business, not the livestock raising business. He's using those cows to harvest his crop of grass. So if you wanna hurt the heart of a rancher, they don't like to be called a grass farmer, but that's what they are. They're farming that grass and using cattle or livestock to harvest their crop. They should be interested in total pounds of beef produced each year, not the number of head of livestock they can raise. So sometimes you can have fewer animals and there's more forage out there because there's less, less mouths eating that grass and you'll have higher pounds of beef, higher weaning weights. And that's what you're actually selling. Speaking to a deer producer or someone who likes deer, the importance to you, now we've shifted from grass to native forbs and browse production. So weeds and brush, that's what the deer are using. Native plants are the cheapest deer feed you can raise. So those plants that you have out there now, that's the best thing you need to be managing for. As a deer manager, you're in the habitat business first and the deer raising business second. You gotta have habitat. You are interested in the quality of deer living on your land based on the quality of the habitat that they have. And you should be interested in age ranges, age ranges of bucks, the buck doe ratios, how many bucks to does, the fawn crops, how many fawns are raised each year, and the deer density in acres per deer. We need to know stocking rate in cattle, and we need to know deer density in deer. And livestock grazing is okay if it's done the proper way. If you do good grazing management, deer and cattle complement themselves really well. Deer and goats compete for the same foods. Deer and sheep can get along. Deer and cattle eat totally different diets. So you're in that grass raising business as a rancher, but a lot of uh, forb and browse raising as a deer manager. Speaking of, to a quail manager, may not be many quail in your country, but they, they can come back. The importance to you of native plant production Native bunch grasses, basketball sized clumps of grass are the best nesting cover you can grow that the quail nest under. <clears throat> You're in the native plant business. Dr. Dale Rollins, you might've heard him talk, retired extension wildlife specialist, says know your plants for whatever you're trying to manage. Know your plants and know how to manipulate the plants. So what do you have to do to make the best habitat? And you should be interested in these types of cover, nesting cover for hatching of the eggs, brooding cover for the young chicks to move around, screening cover, loafing cover, roosting cover, and escape cover. All of that's needed for, for quail. And livestock grazing is okay if it's done properly. 
Speaking to a turkey manager, the importance to you of native plant production. Native bunch grasses are the best nesting cover you can grow, just like for quail. You are in the native plant managing business, a diversity of hard, mast, and soft mass producing woody plants are needed. So the oaks, pecans, walnuts, hickories, plums, these are the things that we need. You're interested in these cover types, very similar to the quail. We've got to have an adequate cover for those young pokes, young turkeys. And livestock grazing is okay if it's done in a proper way. Speaking to a honey producer, the importance to you, to you of native plant production. Native flowering plants are the best pollen and nectaring plants you can grow. You've got Texas kidney wood down there, excellent pollinator plant. You are in the pot plant managing business. You might be in the beekeeping business, but you're a plant manager too. You need to know when the plants are gonna be flowering so that you can move those hives around if you have to, or put them where they can get to a diversity of plants. So this diversity of flowering plants that provides flowers, different plants, but you've got flowers through spring, summer and fall when these pollinators are most active, that's what's needed. And livestock grazing is okay if it's done in a proper way. So what are the common themes for all these land users? The need for and use of native plants for food and our cover, very important. The need for diversity in plant types based on the species you're managing for. Quail need certain plants for food. Deer need different plants for food, but we need a diversity, a diversity of those plants. The need to know your plants and know how to manage them. This is how the folks with the uh, Master Naturalist chapter can come out on the land and show you those plants, show you what you need to do to manage for different things. That's a good program they've got. The need for flowering native plants during three seasons of the year. Uh, deer are pretty well making it on their own in the wintertime without the flowering uh, spring, summer, fall, but the pollinators really need that. And overgrazing hurts all land users and especially pollinators because cattle, sheep and goats, when they run out of their normal diet, they will switch to forbs and browse. And, and that's what the pollinators are most likely gonna be using for pollen and nectar. So livestock grazing is okay. Don't get me wrong. I don't dislike cattle. I like cattle. I like working with ranchers. It's okay if it's done the proper way, but we can certainly do it the improper way and overgrazing, which would hurt wildlife or pollinators, hurts the landowner's bottom end at, at uh, you know, same part. And if you're not a livestock raiser, but you've got a tractor and a shredder, be careful about how much you're shredding. Shredding a lane down on the road to your house is good, but shredding your entire property at the start of winter means that you're gonna have a lack of habitat throughout winter for four or five months before that grass begins to grow back. So be real cautious with the, the shredders. Now I wanna share with you a series of photo points I've, I've been taking for 10 years. This is in Shackleford County, Northeast of Abilene. Here's a uh, rainfall periods, we want to look for between 2011 and 2020. Now I backed it up to 2008 to show you that rainfall prior to 2011 was just kind of average, right above that 25 inch rainfall average. But look at what happened in 2011, 15 inches of rainfall, record drought. 2012, five inches below normal, still hard drought. Three inches below normal, still drought six inches below normal. So they had four years of record drought, followed by, look at 2015, 42 inches of rain. Y'all had a lot of rain in 2015 as well. That was a record year for rainfall. And it was backed up the very next year with almost as much rain. So they had back-to-back -back record rains. Then in 2017 through 2020, it was above average and had one pretty good year, but it was above average rains. So now let's look at this photo and if I'll give you a brief backstory. Uh, I was asked to give a program to a rancher's group in Shackford County uh, in 2011 on what has happened to the quail. We used to have quail in Shackford County, now there's not any. We didn't know, no one did at that time. They've since learned that more than likely, in addition to the loss of habitat on some properties, there are eye worms and cica worms 
Zika worms live in two blind, uh, two extensions of the small intestine, and they are sucking uh, nutrients away from the quail. So that's something that's been learned, but we didn't know that then. Now I went back in time uh, by going back to the field office in Albany and looking in some of their old slides. Every field office has notebooks of uh, 35 millimeter slides in folders. And I went and got some of those. They were taking pictures in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. They got digital cameras in the 2000s. But I was looking in those old photos and one thing I noticed was whatever they were taking a photo of, maybe it was a new fence or a new water trough. But if you look on the background, on the sides of that image, they had grass. They had basketball sized clumps of grass. So I got to thinking, I don't, I know there's a lot of those ranches that don't have that grass cover anymore. They did have it in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, but it's gone now. So that's what I was making the summary of my talk about. And I went back to Albany that afternoon before the program taking photos. And these are some of the photos I took. This was, I've got these spaced every two miles, but this was photo point number five. And if you look in that photo right now, there's no basketball sized clumps of grass. So that's what I originally started taking these photos for, but it changed in the years since. Notice this prickly pear right here. This mesquite will be in the photo. This prickly pear will be in the photo. It'll start growing. This rock will be in the photo. Flat rock, it's got this, I guess, algae that looks like a long handled skillet right there. So here we are in September of 2011. We're in that first year of the drought when it was only 15 inches of rainfall. We go forward to November of 2012. I almost forgot to go out there. So this is the latest photo. I, I got the rest of them in September. But notice we've got cattle in the pasture. We're two years into a drought and they're still holding on to cattle. Uh, cow trail's been freshened up. There's a little bit of broomweed because we got a little bit of rain in January. A one inch rain one time and a two inch rain another time. People thought maybe the drought was over, but it wasn't. And it grew a little broomweed. But look at the prickly pear, it's growing a little bit. That grass that was here at the base of that rock, if we go back, look at the grass. This rock was almost flat in the ground. And now look at that rock, it's, that grass died and dropped away. So let's go forward now to 2013. Look at how much growth that prickly pear's made. We've got a little bit of grass growing back now. This is some three on. This is white tridents right here. All this short grass, some of it that has died was curly mesquite. Now, notice also underneath the drip line of this mesquite that there's a little better grass than there is out here in the open. And there's a little better grass over here under that mesquite. A mesquite is a lagoon and it's got deep roots. It can pull moisture from 30 feet down and it's pulling moisture up, keeping that plant alive. It's also recirculating nutrients. As those leaves fall on the ground, they're brought back into as organic matter and that grass is taking advantage of that. So that's something else, you know, that's things you can learn from photo points over time. So 2013, there's the growth of the prickly pear. 2014, it's making tunas now, it's reproducing. And look at our grasses, still a little bit under the mesquite, a little bit less under this one now, and still not much, uh, out in the open. But again, this was the fourth year of the below normal rainfall. So 2014, 2015 was a wet year, 42 inches. Y'all remember that. In, in the words of a quail hunter, 2015 was a good broomweed year. To a rancher, that's not a good year because this amount of broomweed causes pink eye in cattle and because the cattle are having to push down through that broomweed to get to their grass and they're getting dust and grit in their eyes and it creates uh, issues with especially white-faced cattle. But you can't see the prickly pear, just a couple of pads sticking up right there. Uh, 2016, again, a wet year. Now I have to confess to a couple of trespasses here because I couldn't see these, I decided to crawl under the fence. My days are crawl climbing over fences are over, but I could crawl under the fence, hung the camera on the T-post, walked over here, and I pulled the broom weeds away in 2016 so I could take that photo. And now let's look at a uh, photo from 2017. 
we're getting a little bit of grass. We're back to average rainfall now. Grass is growing. The, the uh, cow trails haired over, so they hadn't been any cattle in this pasture this year. Prickly pear is still growing. It's not making any tunas. And that is 2018. Prickly pear, I mean, the uh, cow trails freshened up, so cows are back in here. And we, you can see a little less. Look at the grass in 17. Look at it in 18, a little bit less because of the grazing. Look at the prickly pear, still hasn't made any tunas, but it's looking like it's back again, healthy. 2000, uh, I can't see that number right there. I'm thinking that's 2019. Look, it's starting to make tunas again. And we've got a good bit of grass, a little bit of broom weed, rocks barely visible. This is the most grass we've had, but still that's not basketball size clumps of grass. So I think the loss of nesting cover is hurting the quail reproduction in Shackleford County. If we go forward to 2020, uh, now this grass back in 2019, this is mostly native grass, but the grass that took over and exploded in the rolling plains and the cross timbers in the winter of 2019 to 2020 was Japanese brome. It just took over. So that's what you're seeing, but we're seeing a little bit of tunas. You're seeing some dirt out here. And what happened was something got in there and destroyed part, about half of this prickly pear, probably feral hogs rooting around. It was done uh, over several times because this was fresh and the rooting right here was old because the grass had grown back over. I want to go back now and kind of summarize this part of what we're talking about. Look at the prickly pear in 2011. I didn't count the pads, but zooming in, I think there's about eight pads there. In three years, it added 55 pads and, and it went to reproducing. And that was three years during the drought. Think about that, how fast it was growing. And I just put those arrows there to show you the overall width. It was approaching six feet of width. Uh, here we are, a, a close up picture in 2015, that first good broom weed year. It added more pads, it's up to 85 now, and it's making tunas, but, Look at, look at it up close in 2016. It actually looks a little sick. You see the light colored yellowish green right here around the margin of the pad. To me, it looks sick, especially down here. I asked the field office, I called them and told them, you know, I'd sent them these photos through the years, but I, I said, ask the rancher, did they spray prickly pear in this pasture this year? And they said, uh, they called me back in about three days and they said, yes. He said that they sprayed prickly pear in that pasture during the winter of 2015 and the first two months of 2016. But they don't know if they sprayed this particular plant since it was real close to the road, but they did spray. And I said, well, it looks to me like it's been sprayed. And I'll probably get, I've got five years of photos, but I'm probably going to take another couple of years of a dying prickly pear. But that wasn't the case. 2016. Look at it in 2017, it's got a healthy green color again. It's still not making tunas, but it's healthy again. 2018, it's adding pads. It's healthy, green color, it's got one tuna, 2018. Here it is in 2019, it's making tunas again, and it's got the green color, grasses are growing up. Here it is in 2020, it's got a few tunas. And it's increasing the number of pads. But in 2020, it actually dropped the number of pads to uh, 59. 44 pads were lost to those feral hogs and they just, they just ate them, took, took them out of there. So let's go back and look at the summary of this. Daryl Eckert down at the bottom, there's his contact or his reference. You can go to Google and find this article on prickly pear ecology. And he said he did a study where he took prickly pear pads, he broke them off plants, dropped them on the ground where they were laying flat, and he did it in replicated studies across several counties out around San Angelo. And he said he would go back the next year and where that one pad had been, the pad would still be alive and it would be producing a pad. Go back in another year and you had four pads. So it was making exponential growth through those early years. And he said it won't last but if it did, it would soon take over your pasture, which it does in a lot of cases. But look at what's happened uh, in the drought years. What I was seeing out there on the ground matched exactly to what he saw. In 2011, eight pads. Three years later, it should have 
exponentially 64 pads and I counted 63. Remarkable growth of that prickly pear during the drought years. And then what caused the prickly pear to look yellow in 2016? The only thing I can attribute it to is that, what about almost 80 inches of rainfall in 2015 and 16. I think the soil got saturated and the plant was under stress. The prickly pear had too much water in the soil. That's the only thing I can think of because it came back, it didn't die. And notice in red here, the pads slowed down 15 and 16, but as it started to go back to normal rainfall, pad growth resumed. And then there's the damaged pads in 2020. So these are things you can learn by just looking at a small piece of land and you can put these photo points up anywhere you want to on your property. No land is too small to have a photo point. Is prickly pear always bad? Not necessarily. It does provide food. Those tunas are eaten by everything. Varmints, wildlife, cattle, everything eats those tunas. But look at what happens after a wildfire. We've got some forbs coming back in the prickly pear because that's where cattle can't graze. But look at what is in front of this living silt fence. The way these prickly pear pads are standing up, it's like a silt fence. Notice the fine material, the soil that's right here compared to how coarse it is back here. That silt fence of prickly pear captured runoff and, and the water might have seeped on through, but it left the soil behind. Look at it here. Look at the fine material in front of this one. Look how coarse it is back here. So prickly pear has a place out on the land. You can have too much of it, no doubt, but all that fine material that was captured, it, it's now growing some mighty nice grass, some Indian grass in front of it. Here's an example of a test you can do on your land. You can take a prickly pear, you don't have to, you can do this in your flower bed. You don't have to have a lot of acres. Just find some prickly pear, take two pads, break them off, put them on the ground, just like this, and come back in one month. You can do it now. You can do it in a couple of months either, anyway, but after one month of being on the ground, turn that pad over and it's gonna start rooting down, rooting. The roots, these thorns don't turn into roots, but the roots originate at the base of the thorns. Then that other pad, turn it over in two months and you'll see what, that, that's how plant, plants are spread. So anytime you're moving and plowing up or brush controlling uh, cedar and you've got prickly pear too, you need to pick up those pads because they're gonna start a new plant. And there's what the close up looks like of those roots. Is this a, uh, a tuna or a pad right here? Again, being observant, Steve sent me these photos, being observant out on the land. He said he saw that and just thought, well, what is that? But look, it had a flower. So it looks like a tuna. Well, he cut it open and sure enough, it made seed. I emailed him back, and asked him, did you gather any of that seed up? It'd be interested to see if this would breed true and come back like that in from seed. And he said, no, he didn't think about getting any seed. And look at this tuna. The tuna should be the fruit that falls away, but this one stayed on and grew a pad. Very unusual. But just, you know, being observant out on the land, you can learn a lot. Here's some shin oak. Y'all have a lot of shin oak in the area. This is three trees of shin oak. Shin oak occasionally makes a tree. Normally you see it as a shrub. But there were three shin oaks in this pasture and I convinced the landowner, let me bring a cage out and let's put the cage around one of them and see what happens. So we put the cage around it during midsummer of 1995. Went back and we took this photo in August of 96. So it'd been about one year of protection. Look at how much growth is being produced by the shin oak in the middle. The same amount's being produced out here, but it's being grazed by, in his case, he had Angora goats native white-tailed deer and cattle, no exotics, but they were impacting that. And he said, you know, I make more money off the deer and my cattle. I think I'm gonna get rid of the goats. And I asked the guys in the field office in 2003, I'd already left to go back out there and take another photo. And here's the cage nearly full of shin oak, but look at reducing the goats, what happened. Uh, it allows more forage even later, this is October, more of that shin oak forage to be available. They're still using it, but they're not eating all of it like they were when you had the goats out there. You can do it with shin oak. 
Anytime you put a cage, though, you need to have one tree in the cage, one tree out of the cage. And that's a visual demonstration of how much browse is utilized. All right, let's go back to looking at the land as a land steward. It, and again, another definition, a really good one. A deeply held inner conviction that motivates landowners and land managers to take good care of the land, not merely for personal gain, but for future generations and for the benefit of society. Just like I mentioned about that uh, runoff into that aquifer recharge, you, you've got to think about a bigger picture than just you. Land stewardship is by definition voluntary. A steward is often also described as a caretaker, a conservationist, husbandry, and custodian. And Rob is looking at the seeds of the, uh, uh, the names Leavenworth Oringo. And these seeds look like little dinosaur seeds. They've got straws on the back. They're white for one thing, which is unusual for a seed. And they've got these straws that look like a dinosaur. So be observant. Now we got caught out in the rain. What's going to happen with water? Those raindrops are falling. They're going to fall on the ground. If we uh, look down this fence, another fence line contrast photo, just a regular old sheep and goat fence, 48 inches tall, not tall enough to uh, stop a deer from crossing, but it might be tall enough to stop a little blue stem from crossing because we don't see it over here. So this is two different landowners, two different ways of looking at the land. Uh, and it's good that we understand about water because water knows no ownership boundaries. If we look at this raindrop. Uh, when a raindrop falls on bare soil, it's like a bomb exploding if there's water on the surface of the soil. Uh, and that exploding raindrop dislodges soil particles, sand, silts, clays, and puts them in suspension with the water and carries them off as erosion. But look at this raindrop that falls over here. It's gonna to have to kiss the stem of that little blue stem, slide down the stem, gonna get down to the leaves, eventually get down to litter and mulch, and eventually it'll get down to the soil and it will soak in. Very little of the water will run off. But over here, when the grass is only a half to one inch tall, we're gonna have some of this action happening and we're going to lose maybe two thirds of the rain to runoff and it carries topsoil with it. So we're losing our most valuable part of the soil, the topsoil. So two different ways of looking at the land. And this is not, you know, just a one time occurrence. Uh, it happens all the time. This, this is a quote from a wise gentleman, a neighbor of y'all's to the West over in Johnson County. Not only was he the 40, uh, 36th president of the United States, he was a native Texan and a rancher. And you can still visit his ranch today. But he said, saving the water and the soil must start where the first raindrop falls. So we're looking at the uplands and we're looking at the riparian areas. We're looking wherever those raindrops fall. We've got to save the water and save the soil. Now, I want to go through, a, give you some quotes here, and I want you to be thinking about the time frame of when this, these quotes were written. Uh, the relationship of reading the land, land stewardship, and its relationship with water is not a new concept. So be thinking about, do you think this was the 1950s after the drought? I think this was the, during the Dust Bowl, when, or when the first Europeans came to Texas? When, when did this happen? In the primitive state of the country, the mountains and hills were covered with soil and there was an abundance of timber. The plains were full of rich earth bearing an abundance of food for cattle. Moreover, the land reaped the benefit of the annual rainfall, having an abundant supply of water in all places, receiving the water into herself and storing it up in the soil. The land let off the water into the hollows, which it absorbed from the heights providing everywhere abundant fountains and rivers. Such was the state of the country, which was cultivated by true husbandmen, what we would call stewards, who made husbandry their business and had a soil the best in the world and an abundance of water. And in the sake of time, I'm gonna just go ahead and give you the answer. Do you think this was 100 years ago, 200 years ago? What about a lot longer than that? 
This is a description of ancient Greece, 400 years BC. But the key points that Plato was talking about, they had good soil, good timber, good grasslands, good water, and good stewardship. But he goes on to say, in comparison of what then was, there now remain only the bones of the wasted body. All the richer and softer parts of the soil have fallen away. A single night of excessive rain now washes away the earth and lays bare the rock. Now the land is losing the water, which flows off the bare earth into the sea. So what he said now is there was a lapse in stewardship. Something happened, management changed, and it caused a loss of vegetation, a loss of the soil, and a degradation of waters. And that's waters that everybody uses. So even 2,400 years ago, they were having issues like we have today. So summing up some things we've been talking about, the role of land stewardship on private rangelands, small or large acreages, conservation is sometimes paved with good intentions, which prove to be futile and even dangerous because they are devoid of critical understanding of the land or of economic land use. We might push for brush control when we actually needed better grazing management to cure the issue of not having enough grass. Aldo Leopold realized this in the 1930s, that land is a community, I can't see the top part of that, is a con concept of ecology, but that land is to be loved and respected is an extension of ethics. Aldo Leopold, there's a nice photo from Lano County of Honey Creek, a beautiful creek. A land ethic in turn reflects an ecological conscience, reflects a conviction of individual responsibility for the health of the land, large or small tracts, we've got to take care of it. And Aldo Leopold said, the landscape of any farm is the owner's portrait of themselves. There, you can see this family's taking pride in that land right there. It looks like they had a prescribed burn or perhaps a wildfire in the background. You see the grass is different height than that where they're standing, but they're proud of that property. Now, how can we make uh, or uh, help other landowners become better land stewards? Well, education, back when we could get in groups like this, and hopefully we will again soon, you could take people to a good operation, a good piece of property that was being well managed and they could learn. They could get encouragement from their fellow ranchers, fellow neighbors that are doing a good job. They can get technical assistance from Texas Parks and Wildlife, Texas AgriLife Extension, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and now through the Master Naturalist Program in Hayes County, the HELM Program. And some agencies even offer financial incentives to do some of these conservation practices that will benefit the land for future generations. And like this ranch here, they didn't have any vehicles on the ranch. The, the ranch roads were built for these UTVs. Well, we had a ranch tour and people had to drive around in UTVs. Even out in the far west Texas where it's dry and they get nine inches of rainfall, you need good management. And I guarantee you that a good land steward will provide a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. They will find that. Do you have love, respect, and admiration for your land? This is a large ranch out in Fort Stockton. The owner, uh, all three are visible right there. The husband, wife, one of the three kids, daughters. The husband passed away, but the family still remained good stewards of the land. For nine inch rainfall, that's excellent grass cover. They were good stewards of the land. How well do you understand your land? Look at this gentleman. Well, look in the background. There's been some cedars pushed, some juniper pushed, but he's out on the ground looking, he got out of the truck and he's seeing plants that he hadn't seen before because now you took out some cedar that was encroaching and there's sunlight hitting the ground and those plants can grow. So he's learning to understand the land. And what kind of portrait does your land paint of you? And land stewardship entails looking at the land differently. This rancher right here is a good land steward. Remember what Hugh Hammond Bennett said, farmers and ranchers only have temporary control over their land it can be theirs for a lifetime and no longer. The public's interest, however, goes on and on. If nations are to endure, land must be nurtured, not plundered and wasted. 
And this is a great quote. Y'all have it in the Master Naturalist book. J.E. Weaver was a prairie ecologist at the University of Nebraska from about 1920 to the 1950s. You can read his papers at the University of Nebraska by looking at them on their website. Nature is an open book for those who care to read, to read the land. Each grass covered hillside is a page on which is written the history of the past, the conditions of the present, and the predictions of the future. That's what reading the land is all about. And we've got to all strive to be better land stewards in our management of Texas. They're not making any more acres of land. We've got to manage what we have. So with that, I'll stop sharing. And if there's any questions, be glad to try to answer them. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Ricky. I think you've given us all an appreciation of the importance of paying attention to what's going on in our land and the understanding um, it's amazing to me how much you can learn by just watching your piece of property. I've owned my property for uh, 13 years now, and I've watched it change. Take um, photos. Yeah, that we we do we do encourage people to take photos because sometimes you don't when you see something happening slowly over time, you don't realize it. But when you look at those photos every every quarter or every every year, there's there's a to you understand what happened. Right. Yeah. Um, let me ask you one question before I start on the questions that are in the chat. Um, you talked a lot about overgrazing, and, and I think most of us here aren't cattle ranching or ha we don't have cows on our land, but we do have two other impediments. We have mowing. A lot of people tend to mow more prop a lot of pro a lot of their properties, or we have people who uh, we have also have an overpopulation of deer. And I'm a, as I understand it, I mean, the impact of deer is slightly different, but the impact of mowing, I imagine, is somewhat similar to over to overgrazing, I would think. Yes. Well, the, the deer can certainly have impact, but they're selective feeders. They're not going to eat much grass. They're eating forbs and browse, right. and they'll come in your flower bed and eat those. But that's a smaller problem, I think, than the mowing, excessive mowing. Because if you mow it now, when you lived in town, and you had a small yard, you kept it mowed because that was the proper thing to do. But when you move out in the country on five, 10, 20 acres, that land should look a little shaggy. You don't want it to be mowed uniformly because nature didn't plant it that way. There's different height plants. And so, like I said earlier, if you want to mow a six or 10 foot wide strip on either side of the road to your house, that's fine. But don't mow out in the pasture. It's not needed, it weakens the grasses. If you take a little blue stem that's four feet tall and you mow it off to eight inches or six inches or even worse, four inches of height, that's extreme overgrazing. And that will weaken that plant as sure as it will with cattle. You're just doing it with a one-time mowing every year or more than that mowing. So mowing is really bad. And it, don't think of your land as looking rough. Just tell people I'm managing the natural way and it should look shaggy because you'll have a little blue stem that's four foot tall, you'll have buffalo grass that's eight inches tall and all sorts of plants in between. So you need to think about it in a different way than when you managed your yard in town. That's a problem I see on ranches and on small properties. Okay, well, let me, let me see if I can find some of these questions here. Um, we've got one question uh, that's how, that also relates to these smaller plots. How, how do those of us with small wildlife plots, 25 acres, strike a balance between wild and manicured? You sort of got at that already while giving a significant focus on land stewardship and can you achieve both? Well, sometimes on small acreages, if we take really good care of it, we are attracting wildlife. And a lot of people want to do that. They want to attract wildlife, but if you attract too many deer and they become a hindrance, you got to remove the hindrance, remove the deer. You can legally shoot deer in Texas. And sometimes you got to bite the bullet and make a decision on what you're going to do out there. And in the case of deer, the deer have to take the bullet. You know, that's, that's the only way to change that. You got to, and, and with small tracks, those deer move around, they cover, oh, a, a, they cover a section of land, 640 acres in their lifetime. 
So they're moving around, but they tend to congregate where there's good food, water, and they don't get harassed. If you don't want to shoot them, well, get out there and chase them on a UTV or a four-wheeler or a Jeep or something. <laughs> run them off. They'll yeah. eventually kind of learn that this is not a friendly place. Uh, but it's, if you, if you uh, try to manage, you can invite, you know, someone in to shoot a deer or two. Uh, one or two deer is not going to make a difference in a big picture, but it does reduce the population slightly. And they will go elsewhere for a few months. So you buy yourself a little time to grow more plants. Well, the other thing, the other thing I, that's interesting, I've been playing around with in terms of a, a concept is to try to. Um, you you had had the, had the fencing around the around the trees for the goats, but the same thing can be done for deers to create yeah. some some deer-free plots that you can use as pollinator area, areas to grow pollinators. And sometimes those, those plants will, will edge out of, of that plot and end up other places too. Yeah. Um, also increasing, some... increasing the diversity on the land makes it look, look much nicer too. You, know, and you, could, this... you could even go out in your pasture, cut some of those cedars and cut some stays, S-T-A-Y-S. They're just the little cedar limbs and make your fence out of those stays with a little bit of wire or net wire, and it'll look like an antique uh, rustic fence. It won't look ugly. It'll look good. Um, you can do that. You can also plant some deer resistant plants. Y'all may have a list y'all can share with people. I think there's yes. a list that Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife puts out. Texas AgriLife Extension has a list of somewhat deer resistant plants. They don't prefer to eat them. They might eat them, but they don't prefer them. Right. Yeah, we we can help with we can help with that and some suggestions on, on increasing the diversity because one of the things when you talk about your ranching, one of the things that hap, hap, happened here is those ranches have ever, have degraded degraded the land, and therefore we've lost a lot of our diversity. You and you mentioned uh, eastern gama grass is the one, which which is wonderful grass that that should be here that isn't that we you can we can start reintroducing. Well, when I was at Gulfweight, I worked with a rancher. He only had 200 acres. He had goats, but he would collect grass seed off the roadside, Indian grass, big blue stem, and he would walk in his pasture and he would take his boot heel and just dig a little trench with his foot and drop a few seeds in and cover it up, take a couple of steps and do it again. And I was out there with him and you could actually see from clump to clump where he had walked. So you can do that. You can make small efforts to re create what was out there early on. Um, if you go onto the, uh, a free website called Web Soil Survey, uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service sponsors it, and you can draw a map of your property. You can draw your boundary, even 25 acres, and you can look at the soil, and if you dig down into it, you can actually get to a historical plant community of what would have been out there before grazing by livestock started. And that gives you a list of the historical accurate plants that you would want to try to restore. Very informative, very interesting to read what those plants were. Yeah, I've That's played with it a little bit. Yeah, it, it's very good. It's very good. I've got another question here on the juniper because you, you apparently are not a friend of juniper, I gather. Right. And uh, sometimes it gets a bad rap, but there's some new thinking about juniper that talks about the possibility of it, you know, it's got, it got a bad rap as a, as a water hog and people are saying now that maybe that's not the case. Um, but is juniper always bad or are there some benefits to, to, to the ash juniper in some, in some instances? Well, let's back up historically. Juniper, when the first settlers came here, they talked about it being up in the hills, in the canyons where fire wasn't getting to. So there was cedar here, but it was limited in where it was found. It wasn't out in the broad grasslands because wildfires, the Indians were setting fire and it was keeping the cedar down. But as we came in and started farming and raising cattle, we stopped the fires, the wildfires, tried to fight them. So that allowed the cedar to spread. So if we can kind of control it and keep it back where it's originally supposed to be, I, I, I'm all right with it. Now, I, I don't hate it. From a landowner standpoint, it takes the place of good grass and good forbs. It shades the ground. But after that cedar has dropped needles on the ground for year after year, 
you might have shallow soils only that thick and you got cedars, but now you've probably got that much humus on top of it. So it actually makes a soil improvement. So it's beneficial in that regard on shallow soils. Um, but clearing excess cedars uh, will allow more grass to grow. Whether it allows more water to flow off is open for debate. Uh, that Bamberger Ranch says it does uh, through what they've noticed. Uh, but a lot of research come out of AM that says after you clear the brush, you get a flush of grass growth and the rainfall that falls is absorbed by the grass and goes into the soil and you really don't get any more runoff into a reservoir for public use, you just grow more grass. So juniper is not well thought of by the ranching crowd, but mature ash juniper, golden cheek warbler habitat, uh, some, some pollinators may use it, larval host uh, applications, but you can certainly have too much cedar. Well, I think what you're saying also is it depends on the property because a lot of the our our areas of Hayes County here are are those up canyon areas and high areas where the cedar did did historically grow. So I, I think the answer is it depends on on your property and it's it's assessing what what you have on your property and and whether how you need to manage it. It is beneficial from a windbreak, a visual. Mm -hmm break and a sound barrier yeah. so if you if you've got a county road right by your house there'll be less noise with cedars between your house and the road yeah. than if you take the cedars out so be careful yeah. about taking too much out yeah so it actually it depends and, that, and that's something we and that's something we can help we can help people with mm -hmm. um we've got one one question here on bees will too many honeybees outcompete native bees does does allowing ag value on the land for honeybees encourage a practice that harms native bees? Well, they're competing for the same flowers, the same pollen, nectar. Uh, so there's competition there. But if you're needing that ag exemption and that's so valuable from taxes, from a tax standpoint, uh, you may want to use it. Uh, honeybees, that's a that's legitimate use for ag value now. but it's, it's competing somewhat, but not everybody's going to do that. So it, again, it's going to be checkerboarded across the county. Not everybody's using that for their ag value. But if you grow enough diversity of plants, they can probably all share. So the bumblebees are not yeah. going to be- as, And that's a good way to end. The bumblebees are not going to be as frequently seen as the honeybees in a lot of cases, especially if you have the hives there, but there'll be enough for everything. Diversity is always a good thing. And that's a good way to end. I, I, that's, that's the end of the questions, but um, I appreciate it. And diversity, yes, the more diversity we can introduce in our properties, I'm, I'm a big advocate of diversity. Well, so um, we, we ran a little long, sorry about that, but I hope y'all enjoyed the presentation. Thank you again for having me. We be enjoyed to, it a lot. <laughs> be glad to do more if you need them. And I'm, and I'm going to say just a couple more words. As I, I, tonight you heard about, about, about getting to know your land, and I think we learned a lot from Ricky. Um, I hope you'll join us next month when we're going to hear about repairing the land. We're especially focusing on erosion uh, and, and invasive species that, that Ricky touched on. And then in May, we're gonna, you're going to learn how to figure out, come up with a plan for your land so you can create, it, create a, a a wildlife plant friendly environment for, because a lot of the people here they're not they're on their land not so much to make money off of it but to enjoy it and enjoying it means having more wildlife and how can we encourage more wildlife is a big question people have here so study the land learn the land learn how to read it and enjoy your land enjoy it for your lifetime and hopefully it'll be better for your kids or someone else to enjoy later <laughs>